In this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast, Leaf Tulane is going to share his thoughts on the top NBA prospects in the Pac-12. You know, Leaf watches more college basketball than anyone else, and the Pac-12 is his region. So find out Leaf's thoughts on the top NBA prospects in the, well, I was ready to say the now defunct Pac-12, but it's still alive and kicking as of right now. But find out soon who Leaf thinks are the top prospects out on the West Coast. Big shout out to each and every person that has made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I appreciate each and every listen, whether you are listening on the way to work, in the car, at the gym, riding a bike. Again, I thank you for each and every listen. I am Rafael Barlow, the director of scouting for NBA Big Board. And like I mentioned in the opening, my co-host for today is Leaf Tulin. Leaf is the guy that watches more college basketball than anyone else. And he has just a few more days until college basketball starts. So tell me, like, what is the first game that you are looking forward to seeing when college Kansas basketball? State, Kansas State and USC. Eight o'clock on TNT. I, I'm oh. already I'm already ready, man. I, I've, I've scoured through the schedule. I know my each and every day what days the Jazz play, so I'll be occupied, so I'm going to have to synergy them. I can't wait. That's all. That's all I've been thinking about for the last couple of days. So, I, I wish it was the Champions Classic, like how it used to start. But I'll, I'll take college basketball in any form. I, I binge watched all the scrimmages recently too. As of today, is Bronny playing? I don't think he will, but I, I don't know. There's no. I, I I wouldn't be surprised if he plays by the end of the year. I, I'd be a little surprised if he plays at the beginning. They've kept that situation tight lipped, <laughs> like. I haven't heard anything. Only thing I've seen is, you know, just the I guess the the video of him dancing. I don't know. Was it like their their midnight madness or something like that? Some event mm-hmm. they had. And then I saw a video of him like riding a scooter around around downtown LA. But I haven't really seen much or heard much about whether Bronny's playing or not this season or when he's playing. Well, I've heard that he is playing. I think that came from LeBron himself, but I haven't seem like a, a date i haven't even seen videos of him like practicing or or anything so it, it's definitely been been kept kept close to home all right who is your number one prospect in the pac 12 yeah I'll, I'll go with someone who's pretty standardly rated up up at the top it's gonna be isaiah collier from usc Bronny's teammate but he's the better prospect of the two. He was the higher rated high school player as well. Uh, he's a big guard, gets downhill, creates. Uh, I think it'll be very interesting to see how he and Boogie Ellis, who is the returning lead scorer for USC, how they mesh and how those two coalesce. Cause I think that'll really make it a USC. If they both, if they mesh well as a good team. And I also wonder how that impacts um, call your stock, because if he's playing on the ball, but feeding someone else scoring, do people view him as a scoring guard that that has the capacity to score in the NBA, or vice versa? If he scores and doesn't create, uh, what are what are the pundits going to say? So I am curious about that, but I do think he's got the most talent of any player in the Pac-12. So he's my highest rated player. Do you have any concerns about the jump shot? I think it's a little difficult to say at this rate. I think what he does best is get downhill. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean I have terribly well-formed concerns because I, I wouldn't say it's a super strength, but I don't think it's something that I'm like, it's a glaring weakness either. I think it might be a glaring weakness, man. I think he's a, a, a guy that has been so good at getting downhill that he really hasn't had to shoot jumpers in games because he can get to a spot whenever he wants to. I mean, he's, you could say he's bigger, stronger, and faster than a lot of the guards that he's faced. And I just think the jump shot is is so far behind because he hasn't really needed it. And then I think it's going to be even shakier off the catch. I think he should be able to be maybe decent off the dribble pulling up. But, I mean, if you think about Isaiah Collier, how many times has he probably played – off the ball and had someone feeding him passes on the catch. I have some concerns about the jumper, but 
other than that, man, I think he's a phenomenal playmaker. And he just has this this impact on games and the way he I mean, he, I mean, he just makes people better. So I like him a lot. Yeah, I think one one thing I would agree with is that we haven't seen him play off the ball, which is part of my concern for just USC in general. We Boogie Ellis likes the ball in his hands as well. But I also wonder how their offense is going to play to his strengths because I think Collier will be the one. But a lot of their players are more slashing oriented rather than shooting. And I'm curious to see how they free up the paint for him. Like, do they play some small ball? Because I think that'll give us our first like litmus test of how well he shoots off the dribble is because he's going to have people pack into the paint and say, hey, shoot this. And if he can make a few of those, I think his respect level is going to grow. But for player like people like us who analyze shot and all these nuances, because everyone knows he's talented and skilled as a playmaker. But this is the first like competition where people could, in theory, stay in front of him. And I think they're going to give him a cushion to begin with. And I think maybe kind of like Jalen Suggs, he'll be someone who knocks down shots and punishes drop coverage at the college level, but it's not necessarily like a beautiful jump shot. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. All right, who's the second best NBA prospect in the Pac-12, in your opinion? I mean, it's, uh, it's wide that, open. That's that's the real question. So I'll, I'll give a bunch, and I'll, then I'll choose one. Uh, I, I would say that the highest ceiling guy – if he were to hit, absolutely, it would be a day Mara, but I, I've got I've got some concerns about him. But and he's a big at UCLA. Cody Williams, the younger brother of Jalen Williams, is attending Colorado. I'm a little lower than I think the consensus on him. And then the last guy that that I think people should think about would be, and I, I would say I'm a little lower on him too. Like none of these guys are really blowing me out of the water. Is Kwame Evans? Okay. Uh, I I would. I would be a little shocked if any of those guys at, like are consistently projected to be lottery. So I'll, I'll, I'll address Mara to begin with. I, I think he's got the highest ceiling a day Mara. And that's if he hits, I think there's, there's a few things. One, he's playing with a Dembona who I would also throw in this conversation. A Dembona is going to be in the paints. So that means a day Mara you're going to have to show as a shooter and a, as a passer and how real are his defensive traits that people some people think are amazing because he's seven foot three and he's coordinated and other people think, okay, maybe he's a statue and maybe these uh, defensive traits are, aren't what they used to be. Like he's, he could be a, like someone who stands at the rim and impacts the shot, but now the game's so centric on spacing it out and attacking pace and space. So I actually have a lot of questions about two through five Collier's like easily, easily the best prospect. So I, I don't have a strong feeling about any of the above. I, I think college basketball is going to really help, um, like differentiate these guys. Cause I think a lot of these guys are kind of floating on rumors. Like even Cody, Willi- Cody Williams is using a lot of, Hey, my brother's Jalen Williams, which I think is giving him bumps and it's not necessarily a detriment to him. I just think that's the way it's perceived. Yeah. I have heard some people feel like he's getting the benefit of the doubt because people missed out on Jalen and they don't want to miss out on, on Cody Daymar, let, let's let's talk about him. What are your your thoughts on him as far as like his draft range? Personally, I have him about at the, at the highest around eighteen. I, I could see him going mid second round. Even uh, I think a lot of the UCLA players. I'll just say this out front: a lot of their European imports. Jan Vita is the one that I know you're higher on. And I actually really like him. I think they may do better coming out of sophomores, like Burke, um, Bayou Tunsil. I, I I like the way he plays, but I just don't mm-hmm. see him immediately. Jan Vida, I'm curious to see how he adapts to American basketball and just the college scheme. A day is the same thing. I think he'd do better if he if he took a second year and played as a featured big and a Dembona goes to the draft. And I don't know if that's how it's going to play out, but I I have my concerns about his athleticism. And some of those people who say he's always Pau Gasol reincarnated, I, I think that's a little rich. And I just think those are unfair expectations to put on someone. Yeah, I can't really get with the with the Pau comparisons, even though I, I guess if you look at, OK, he's he's Spanish. He's very skilled. He can score with both hands around the block and he's a really, really gifted passer. So on, on that on that hand, I can see why people are making the comparisons, but I think Powell is just a much more gifted athlete. He was more agile. He was more coordinated, more powerful in, in a sense. While I just, 
have some concerns about Mar, especially in today's NBA when you're expected to defend in space. And so he's one of the guys that I'm just really, really interested in seeing how I mean what his role is gonna be, how he's gonna play next to next to Bona. I mean, the the Turkish kid, Barrick, I, I think he's really like a natural four in, yeah. in a sense. And so he's if he starts, he's gonna have to play the three. So UCLA is going to be very interesting. All right, when we return, I want to talk a little bit more about a Dem Bona. Well, actually, I want to get Leaf's thoughts on the Dem Bona and the rest of the NBA prospects in the Pac-12. We have to talk to you about FanDuel because FanDuel has this promotion right now where if you are a new customer, you can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning five dollar money line bet again i'm gonna repeat that 150 bucks if your team wins and with FanDuel, it is i mean it's the perfect season for or the perfect season the perfect time for you to join the nfl season is in full swing the nba season is a week old so you have plenty of options and FanDuel gives you plenty of betting options from spreads to player props overs and unders and more so visit fanduel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL and NBA season. FanDuel, which is the official partner of the NFL and Locked On. All right, once again, big shout out to each and every person that's made the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast your first listen of the day. I want you to like, I want you to share, subscribe, and comment on the YouTube channel. In the next few days, we're going to be doing previews for the 23-24 college basketball season, which is now finally right around the corner. I dropped an episode yesterday with my brother James where we we were supposed to cover the top prospects in the SEC. We didn't make it past Kentucky. We ended up having this debate over Justin Edwards. I have Justin Edwards number one on my preseason board, and my brother thinks Justin Edwards is a late lottery pick he doesn't see him as as high as i see him so it's a it's a debate between brothers that we just happen to have recorded in, in the form of a podcast so check it out all right so leaf you talked about a couple of ucla guys is a dim bonnet your third pack 10 or pack 12 prospect or is there somebody that you have ahead of him uh, i think uh, i think i'd go with cody williams ahead of bona just because i think he what he is, even though I think his stock may be inflated by players, I mean, teams and executives and analysts alike missing on his brother, I do think what he does well is what is desired in the NBA. Now, the question is, how well will he shoot? How well will, well will he defend? And how often will he have the exposure of guarding other NBA caliber athletes? Because I think that's what hurt his brother. Is it was like, oh, you're at Santa Clara, so you play Gonzaga twice, and you had two good games against Gonzaga, but so be it. Uh, I don't think the Pac-12 is littered with wings this year that really are going to make you stand out. So I, I would put him third just because I think the archetype is more friendly than what a Dembona's is as an undersized four, but I do like a uh, – sorry, undersized five. Um, but I do like a Dembona. I think Bona is – a guy who can compensate for his lack of height with athleticism, but I don't think he's really grown that much in two years, maybe even three years when, when he first was like on anyone's radar at all. And I know, you know, very well, having seen him firsthand while he was in Europe for me, it's but, been five, five years. Uh, well, it will be five. it will be five, four and a half, five years. Cause I first saw him in 2019, but I think he was like 16 years old at the time. Yeah, Bona, Bona, I think the main appeal for him was like, you see like this Kenneth Fareed type of impact, like better mm -hmm. defensively, but like tenacious rebounder, someone who's going to dunk all over you. And then his athleticism kind of stagnated. Um, I think he just put on too much weight. That's just my opinion. Yeah. I feel like he's just bulked up too much. I, I think that's very possible. And and I wonder if he'll play at a lighter weight with a Mara playing alongside him and him playing a little bit of the four. Um, but but uh, basically, you're seeing an energy big. So the, that prototype is a little less valuable now, but I still think there is use for it. And you're seeing some teams playing pick and roll bigs with with like heliocentric guards that make them very worth uh, like worthwhile to select. So I think there is a market for bonus, just a little little less important than maybe the the avenue that Cody Williams is opening up as someone who could emulate his older brother. I like Cody Williams a lot. 
I, I really like him a lot. Like when I go through my notes, I have so many things that I consider like his his strengths and his positives. But then that outside shooting is very worrisome. He was small sample size, but he was two for eight from I don't I got to check my notes again. I don't know if it was jump shots or three pointers, but I have two for eight which is 25% at USA Basketball. Again, very small sample size, so I'm not holding that part against him. But when he played for the Vegas Elite, he was 16 of 84, 19%. So I don't know if that's jump shots or three-pointers. Either way, if it's just jump shots, that's not good. Even if it's three-pointers, that's not good. But he does so many things well. Do you think that because he does so many things well, and he can handle the ball, and he is a good passer, that the best way to use him is in a role where he's like, maybe not necessarily a primary, but a featured ball handler, because I think he could really struggle off the ball. See, that's part of the reason I'm a little bit lower, is because I know Colorado has a player in Simpson who is going to be on the ball quite frequently, and then you'd argue that Tristan De Silva should get the ball more if they want to show an upperclassman with a lot of talent and probably their best overall player in terms of college basketball. Uh, that's part of the reason I have him a little lower than the consensus because I anticipate he'll be off the ball. But like you said, that's not exactly what we're um, we're evaluating. We're evaluating it with a blank slate. And I, I think if he were to play on the ball, his stock would increase because he'd be like, look at this freshman, six seven, six eight playmaker. And even if he doesn't shoot well, people would look past that and and be excited about him. However, now if he's like a secondary creator who shoots poorly, it's probably like there's flashes in the pan, kind of like what Colby Jones was at Xavier before this past year. And I think he's a better athlete than Colby Jones. That's just someone that popped in my head. But no one was really sold on him until he had the ball more frequently and improved his numbers from the perimeter. And I think Cody Williams will have to shoot moderately well to make people believe that he can be an impactful player without the ball in his hands. Yeah. That's something that I'm looking forward to seeing. Cause I like him a lot. I really like what he brings to the table. I like his positional size. Like I said, he's a good athlete. I love the offensive creativity. He can, he can get a bucket again. I like wings. that can get a bucket. If you have a big wing that can, that can score and whether it's scoring off the dribble or, you know, in transition and he finishes well at the rim. It's just he has one glaring weakness. Well, I would say the biggest glaring weakness is that he's not a good shooter at this point. I do also have a little bit of concerns that he's not really physical. I think sometimes he kind of shies away from contact. And so we'll, we'll see if that uh, continues through, throughout this season. All right. Who's the next prospect that you want to cover? I think it's got to be Kwame Evans. I, I'm I'm not I don't know enough about him, frankly. I've watched some of his games, but there's just not as much that I think applies to college basketball the way I think college basketball will be played with his tape from high school, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a lot of guesswork left to be done. And I think Dana Altman's pretty good at making these jigsaw puzzles work in the sense that, hey, I'll let a prospect shine uh, and do his work and we're going to try to win. But the last few years, they've been not very good. So I wonder if they'll play a little more reserved and play through their upperclassmen, which would be in Folly Dante. And now what does Kwame Evans do? And how much does Mookie Cook play with the ball in his hands? Kwame Evans, for those of you who don't know, 6'9", 200 pounds, power forward, maybe even a small forward, depending how you want to skin, uh, skin that positional debate. But I, I just wonder what his role will be for Oregon. It's a little too unclear for me to have him higher. Yeah, I mean, when I watch his film, I I also see the intrigue there. I mean, he's I've seen him listed at six nine, and then there's some wing skills, but he's a guy that is really good in the open floor, a transition finisher. Um, I mean, there's some appeal that's like a a big wing shooter and defender. What do you think about his athleticism? I would say he's fluid, but not explosive. Uh, if I that have, makes sense. I have good coordination and agile, but I, I have like as far as like the vertical pop and explosiveness, I, I have average also. Yeah, I, I think I think that's the way I'd put it. I think he looks good compared to high schoolers, but I wouldn't say like he looks 
like an an otherworldly athlete like many that fit his archetype do compared to their peers. So in my notes, I have good long-term potential, but for some reason just doesn't pop out on film. Struggle shooting, but had a positive assist to turnover ratio. Crashes the glass, and, and he's a really good transition scorer and cutter. Did he pop out on film to you? Uh, not really. I, I think you knew who he was just because he he's bigger and, and more fluid than most guys that he played with or against. But yeah, I, I would say a guy who popped out more on film, but I just have some reservations about would be Mookie Cook. Uh, I actually had a conversation with my one of my good friends who's he doesn't do this full time or anything, but he, he knows a lot about the NBA draft and we always bounce ideas off each other. And he really likes the way he plays and thinks he could be someone who sneaks his way into higher in the draft than most people think. Uh, I, I think he's got more highlight worthy skills, but I just don't know how his skills translate to college as much as the size and fluidity probably helps in some capacity for college basketball of Kwame Evans. Does Kwame Evans remind you any of Troy Brown in a sense? Is that just a lazy comparison because they're both organ guys in a sense? Because Troy Brown was like to me when I watched him, he didn't really stand out on paper or, or on film, but you saw that he did a lot of things and he had this size. I don't is, is he even in the NBA right now? Uh, he w- he was last year. Uh, he was on the Lakers briefly, but I'm not I'm not sure yeah, if he is I don't anymore. Really remember? Am I uh, tripping? Is, is there some type of, or is it just the organ organ thing? I I can see it. I, I think I would I would argue that Evans is probably more athletic than Brown, but that's with the most recent viewing of Brown being more like a spot up guy in the NBA who's trying to carve out a role role playing like a shooter, which he wasn't in college. Yep. So that there I put that caveat in terms of my impression being a little bit tainted. Uh, I do think there's a higher ceiling for what Evans was. Like I rem- I was not personally very high on Troy Brown come when he came out of the draft. And I know I think he went 15th, but I he went pretty I just, high. Yeah. I, I had him as a second round pick that year. I, I watch a lot of Pac-12 basketball, and I didn't really have the tools that I have now, like Synergy. I was watching games like all the time as a high schooler, but I didn't. I didn't really love what he brought to the table in terms of his shooting wasn't great, his defense wasn't great, his athleticism wasn't great, and he was good at a lot of things at the college level, but they didn't really like shine out to me as something that would it, that would translate. I think there's more possibility for Kwame Evans to have skills that translate. But that said, I'm not even banking on him being a one and done like that. So that's why I would say mm-hmm. I've got some hesitancy. I think I mean, there's an argument that like Jan Vita is more more ready to go right away. I I still think the UCLA guys, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Burke, uh, Buchton Shell. Uh, I, I even think they have a French guy. I'm forgetting his name right now that I think is a two three year project. Yeah, uh, I think it's it's I know it's like Ilian Fubule or something like that. Yeah, I- Ilian. Uh, I like what I saw. I've granted, I haven't seen it very much. I think they have more long-term potential, but like we're talking the 2024 NBA draft. So I think it's a little bit of a barren cabinet, to be honest. And and one upperclassman I'll toss in real quickly would be Tristan Da Silva. I think Da Silva has enough shooting and enough like know-how guile to make an NBA as someone who can play like a reserve role. Kobe Johnson. I like Kobe Johnson too. I, I like him because he seems like he has a very translatable role to the NBA. Like he is someone that every team is looking for that type of guy. May not have like this tremendous upside that, you know, people are looking for. I think he's a guy that there's going to be a lot of players drafted ahead of him that won't stick, especially in this 2024 yeah. draft. I think it's so wide open, but I think he's very, very safe. And I think he's a guy that could be a second round pick that ends up playing like nine, 10 years in the NBA. What are your yeah, thoughts he, on his strengths? And so some areas that you want to see him address this year. He actually was the next guy I was going to bring up. I, I think the obvious thing would be that his perimeter shooting is kind of like a, a swing skill. If he really shoots it well, he'll stick because defensively 
I think the award will go to a big just because the conference is extremely big, heavy. Maybe Braxton Mia would be my favorite for the defense player of the year. Maybe, maybe uh, Joshua Morgan, uh, his Kobe Johnson's teammate. But if it were like, Hey, who's the player who takes the toughest assignment the most frequently and does a great job. It's Kobe Johnson by landslide to me. I think he had a, he had a claim even with Jalen Clark. Jalen Clark was the best defender in college basketball, probably on the wings, but he was a close second in the back 12 last year. He reminds me a little bit of like Tory Craig in the sense that Tory Craig's probably a little more thick, a little more rugged, but he's not someone who's going to shoot a ton, but he's going to slash, put himself in good situations and, and be someone who influences the game in a positive direction, both offensively and defensively, because he doesn't force up shots. He's going to drive and kick. He's going to opportunistically score on putbacks and defensively he's going to take away your best wing player. So I, I agree that Kobe Johnson is definitely draftable and it depends how teams see it. Like more teams may think like the nuggets who have been taking upperclassmen that play more frequently and sooner. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas a lot of teams late in the late in the rounds uh, are taking guys with potential and, and taking youngsters. So I'm, I'm curious to see how that, that balances out this year, especially in a class that I wouldn't say is very top heavy. Yeah, Kobe Johnson from USC. I have him listed at 6'6", 200. I think he carves out a role as an energy player. Very good or has a knack for getting offensive rebounds and making hustle plays. What I think that he can do that I would like to see a little bit more, which I think could help his draft stock, I would love to see him get some actions out of ball screens because I think he's a good decision maker and passer. And... I would love to see just if if he can make plays out of ball screens. He could be someone that if he doesn't get that opportunity in college and then all of a sudden you see him in summer league and you're like, oh, wow, he can he he can make plays for others. Because I, like I said, I think he's a good passer and ball mover. I think he's unselfish. I think he's like the the perfect role player because his game is already suited or he well he plays the role now that I think he's going to play in the NBA so I think that helps but like you said the swing skills the shooting and I mean he he was respectable he shot like 36 percent from three last year he shot like 60 percent at the rim he's a good foul shooter so everything is there but like I said I'm I'm predicting a, a younger player with the Perceived higher upside will be selected ahead of him, but Kobe will have a longer career than several guys drafted ahead of him. Yeah, I, I said Tory Craig. He reminds me a little bit of Bruce Brown as well, and, and not necessarily what we saw with the Nuggets. I got him a twenty-two million dollar contract, but like what Bruce Brown did with the Nets, someone that'll embrace a role, rebound, defend, defer to players that are better with the ball in their hands, and then just be like happy to get shots. And he'll work as a corner three point shooter. I think a lot of like the better known player that in college basketball that is comparable is Kevin McCuller. I think Kobe Johnson's a far better shooter than Kevin McCuller. And Kevin McCuller would have been someone I would have drafted last year, even though he looked very poor in the at the combine. But I think he'll he'll have a lot of people liking him again this year after Kansas is one of the better teams in the country. Yeah, I mean Kansas is gonna be really good. I mean, the swing skill for for Kevin is definitely Definitely the shooting, but even then, like I think Kevin could have a Bruce Brown type role because we did see Kevin play point guard at Texas Tech, and that's what Bruce Brown played at at Miami, and and so that's why I wonder like if Kobe is going to get an opportunity to show that he can make decisions with the ball, not necessarily just as like a ball mover, quick decision guy, but a guy that you can run pick and rolls through, I, then I think that will really, really help out this draft stock. Was, it, was there any other players that that you that that you feel can be drafted this year? There, there's a couple I think are are stretches, but there's a chance. I, I'm curious to see real quickly, we'll, we'll sell some people on Jan Vita because I know you and I and Richard have discussed him before, and I've said I'd prefer him to come out as a sophomore, but what's the appeal and can you see him coming out this year? Um, Jan is a, is a guy that I first started watching, I, I think at the U16s, and he was a dominant scorer. He's a very confident scorer, loves to get downhill. I mean, when I watch him, it, this is, it may sound like a lazy comparison because he's Slovenian, but it looks like he watches 
a lot of Goran Dragic film. The way he plays just gets downhill. He just has struggled as a shooter. And I was actually in Spain and I was at Real Madrid's um, practice facility. And I ended up talking to some people like former for coaches or whatever. And I mean, they really like him a lot, but they're curious to see how he adapts to, to, um, you know, college basketball in a sense, because he's a guy that's had like multiple roles. Like when he played for Real Madrid, which is a team that's just loaded with talent, he his role was condensed. But then when he's playing for the Slovenian national team, I mean, he has like the green light on top of the green light. And he put up some big performances in FIBA play, but it is just all like getting downhill and, and being aggressive. And it's interesting because that's kind of like how Nikola Topic is playing right now, who is like lighting <laughs> up the draft world and lighting it up over in Europe. But Topic is a better playmaker and Topic is definitely a better shooter. Like you can't go under Topic's screens because he's very good. But yeah, I mean, for Vide, I, I think it's just going to boil down to his outside shooting. Yeah, I think he'll probably be UCLA's leading scorer. You um, think so? I, I think so. Uh, it be, just because I think they'll they'll play through him. I think that a lot of what Burke is going to do is going to come from the mid range, and I just don't think there's going to be enough volume from the mid range in today's basketball. And a Dembona will get a lot of lobs. I don't quite see Mara putting up crazy numbers. I think he'll be more upside based. So I think Vita is probably their lead scorer. That, I'm not. I don't know that for sure, but. And then two other guys that I have my eyes on. These are a little deeper cuts, but bear with me. I love me some Pac-12 basketball. Uh, we talked. I mentioned Braxton Mia. I, yeah. I know you've talked about him before. He's a really good defender. And I think in terms of like what you stereotypically think, like, hey, the conference has all these guys like Brandon Carlson, who's been first team a couple times. You got Umar Balo. You got Infali Dante. He gets lost in the he gets lost in the spread of centers. But I think he's got the most potential of those guys. And one of his teammates is KJ Lewis. He's a kind of a wing that's rangy defensive wing. Uh, I think he's probably not a one and done, but I, I feel Dallas like he's kid. worth. Yeah, he's worth mentioning just because he's got a lot of desirable skills. And the last one I'd bring up, and maybe I'm a little biased as a Stanford fan, but Maxime right now he's a French big man who can step out and shoot a little bit, and he's skilled. I do think he's a little. I would, I don't want to say soft and that because that like perpetuates a stereotype of Europeans not playing as aggressively. And I wouldn't say it's necessarily that. I just think he's got to work on on the interior being a little more physical and scoring using his size because what he's he's very re- reliant on on skill and and situation. But there are some games that he shows a lot of talent and he puts up double doubles. I think Stanford will be a little bit better this year. And if if they are, he'll he'll be a large reason as to why. Yeah, I, I like Braxton Mee a lot. I think that he is very underrated. Has, I mean, everything that teams look for in like this this rim roller. I mean, he's a phenomenal athlete. Was one of the nation's leaders in dunks. The question that teams may have about him is on the defensive end. Even though I know you say he's a great defender, but they play zone. And, and yeah. So I, I, that's probably going to be something that teams are going to to really wonder about him. And that. Uh, I'm just curious, like if you're an NBA team and you see this guy that is athletic and bouncy and, and he has the tools to be like a a very good defender, but his team plays zone, like how do you evaluate that? It's almost like, are you, are you just going to guess or do you just wait until the combine to see him play man to man? Yeah, I, I mean, maybe it'll take a bit to learn it, but I, I would bet on traits in that case. I mean, I was begging the jazz for all Twitter for Jaden McDaniels who played in that same system as a zone guy. And a lot of questions were like, Oh, what, what his shot selection was terrible, blah, blah, blah. All these things that were true, but a lot, like some people had questions about defensive abilities because it was all in a zone. So who knows how real those instincts were? Well, I think he's the best perimeter defender in the NBA. That's not a, like a guard as in drew holiday. Like I think, I think for small forwards and up, in terms of what he does in the perimeter, I think he's the best defender in the NBA. I'm not comparing Braxton Mia to him whatsoever, but I don't think necessarily the zone denies what what traits are real. I think I think Matt Braxton Mia is a very good leaper. His timing is really good despite being in a zone. He uses length effectively. I would say he he needs to not foul. 
um, Mm -hmm. would be the big thing. I think a lot of what he does is he leaps and jumps. Um, But I think refining traits is easier than trying to have a player who like just somehow finds traits. Uh, So I I actually see him as an NBA player and I don't think enough people know about him. Yeah. I I don't know why. Like I got some stats for you. Um, He shot 71% from the floor last year, 88% on cut to the rim, 88, eight, I'm sorry, 82% as a role man, 94 in transition. And not only is he a good rim protector from his zone, but he has some amazing dunks last year. I'm talking like oh, yeah. backwards dunks, lobs. I, I can't help but say this guy could turn into DeAndre Jordan, a young DeAndre Jordan. And that will be a, a tremendous win because, I mean, he has the size. The size is definitely there. And, and so, um, I mean, yeah, offensively, he's limited outside of like dunks and, and putbacks and doesn't necessarily space the floor. Um, he is a little bit raw when you give him the ball and say, like, make a play. Like, there are times where he gets the rebound and he puts the ball down low and 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 doesn't keep it high and get kind of gets stripped. But he is someone that I'm really high on and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing this year. Yeah, he, he reminds me a little bit of Isaiah Jackson at Kentucky. A couple years ago, but someone he's bigger. Who, Isaiah Jackson, he, he's smaller. bigger. Yeah. Yeah, he's bigger, but I, I the way I I think they're comparable because both of them are extremely good vertical athletes and they get blocks in bunches as opposed to like some players influence shots and they're like, you know, like Marcus Sol would be the thing, like positional defenders. These guys are both like leapers and they're gonna reach for the heavens and try to block you. And the reason I bring them like Isaiah Jackson's a more fluid athlete, he's thinner, he's a little smaller. But I think they're similar because when you put them on a floor with someone who's a a good point guard, I think they could be really good role guys, but you don't want them having the ball in their hands. And then defensively, they're very prone to jump, but their timing is just impeccable. Like there's not many players have have this type of timing and there are players that will get a lot of blocks, but they, they are more refined. These guys are raw as can be. And then they put up the numbers. So I, it's a little bit of a stretch, but when I watched Washington play, I, I sometimes saw this just like, hey, block, 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 and then you see him get a stupid foul, and it reminded me of the way Isaiah Jackson played for Kyle Perry in, at Kentucky a few years ago. Makes sense. Makes makes a lot of sense. Well, that wraps up this episode of the Locked On NBA Big Board Podcast. Once again, thank you, the listener, for making this your first listen of the day. Then the next episode, we will have another conference preview. So we've covered the SEC with my brother, and we're going to have to turn that into a part two because we missed out on the Alabama prospects and and Arkansas guys because we ended up spending a whole episode on Kentucky. But Kentucky has, they they could have like five, six guys selected in in this year's draft. And then Leaf just did the Pac-12, so we still have the Big Ten. We still have the ACC. We got the Big East, and we got the Mid-Majors. So stay locked in to Locked On for your conference previews of the top prospects in the 2024 NBA Draft. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow with Leaf Tulane, and we are out.